Hello, my name is Rain, and welcome to my channel where I discuss Fantasy Formula 1. Las Vegas Grand Prix concluded, and, uh, well, we have a lot of things to talk about. Qatar is this weekend, it's a sprint weekend, two more weekends remain. Max Verstappen is champion, let's just get right into the video. So first off, Max Verstappen is once again the champion of the world. You can't say anything other than, I mean, he's the best at the moment, he's the GOAT. He is only, like, the third ever... Because I'm, I'm going to assume that Red Bull stays in third in the constructors. He's only like the third ever to win the Drivers' Championship from with a car that finished third in the constructors or lower. And the last time that happened is like the 80s. Uh, I mean, what a driver. And it's it's hard to say. I think we just have to give it to Max Verstappen now that he is the best. Uh, I think the, I don't know if you saw the clip with, with him and, and Zach Brown where, where Max was like, oh, I, I, I need to... I need the fastest car to win, huh? Really funny. Uh, I love Max. I've said that before. I love Max. I'm just not a Red Bull fan. But Red Bull need to pull pull some stuff together if they're going to replicate that next year. Because with the way the car is right now, and especially the way Checo's driving, they're not getting anywhere close to the, uh, the constructors. Not even close. But there will be a, uh, a lot of pressure to keep the momentum up and win a fifth consecutive title for max but considering how good the other teams behind him are i'm talking mclaren i'm talking ferrari i'm talking mercedes this time in vegas if they keep taking points of each other and max continues to be the ever consistent and just keeps getting those p2 p3 p4 finishing as high as the car's physically able to finish he he is the front runner for next year even if the car is the third best so, with that said, let's move over from the F1 talk and talk about the good stuff, the F1 fantasy stuff. Uh, so, this was my team. If you didn't watch the deadline stream, I ended up transferring Piastri out for Sainz and Yuki Tsunoda out for Nico Hulkenberg. And the justification was that uh, I had looked at Mercedes a lot and I thought the Mercedes would be really good in qualifying. I just didn't think that would replicate in the race pace. There was a lot of calculations on the on the long run pace from the free practice sessions where Mercedes did not look to be the best. But the Mercedes just sometimes works. And this was one of the races where it works. But how it ended up with the constructor points, even though Mercedes finished a 1-2 with Hamilton climbing from 10th, right? They were not that far ahead of McLaren and Ferrari in terms of points. Right, let's go over to the almost filled out F1 Fantasy Tool site and look at uh, look at the results here. I mean, Hamilton obviously got driver of the day. I think Russell is like the only driver bar like Norris who's not getting driver of the day for wins anymore. Even though I do think he kind of deserves it. But, uh, you know, Hamilton had an amazing drive uh, climbing from P10. So, so I get why Hamilton got it. But scrolling down to the constructor side, even though Mercedes got a 1-2 finish, they only finished 10 points above Ferrari and only 16 points above McLaren so I don't actually feel that bad that I didn't go for for the Mercedes punt I I did make uh some plans about it I'm a, if you saw my my team selection video that was that was a big part of it how I could fit Mercedes in if I wanted them but the the sort of thing that pushed me into going without Mercedes was actually the future right it was Qatar because spreading my funds to get Mercedes in likely meant taking Ferrari out and not McLaren because I really want McLaren for Qatar I expect their car to be the best there now this is a mere just guess from my point right but I did not want to go without McLaren and Norris in Qatar in the sprint race there so if I were to sell Ferrari to Mercedes and bring in Mercedes assets and then upgrading my C tiers, I would use three transfers and then I wouldn't be able to go back to the team with McLaren Ferrari if Mercedes looked bad in Qatar where the temperature is obviously higher. So it all came down to the fact that, you know, the race pace of the Mercedes in pre-practice, the long run pace didn't look that much better. Yes, they were better in, in the single run pace, but, you know, I thought they would just get overtaken. And in the beginning of the Vegas race, it kind of looked like that was going to happen, right? Uh, it looked like Charles Leclerc would pass Russell initially, but then, I mean, those tires just dropped off immediately. And uh, Russell could sail on to win the race. Hamilton climbed up fantastically uh, from P10. 
But again, I did not lose that much. And if you went with Mercedes, congratulations. I mean, a, an amazing shout. Well done. Brave of you. I just don't feel that bad that I went without them. And I mean, for McLaren specifically, they got saved by two things. 15 points that they just gained for kind of nothing, really. Um, and I know it's not nothing, right? But we've talked a lot about what's wrong with f1 fantasy in light of the survey if you haven't seen the uh, semi-official f1 fantasy end of year survey link down below fill it out give your opinion on the game f1 actually f1 fantasy will look at the results of that survey at the end of the year and see what they can improve for next year so definitely fill it out uh we've talked about the dnfs being too big right the negative points are too big and i agree with that but Looking at the results in that race of Mercedes compared to Ferrari, compared to McLaren, I feel like there should be more of a points difference, right? But these nothing points, the driver of the day, uh, the driver of the day points uh, for for Hamilton is, is just for the for the driver, right? So the constructor doesn't see that. And then the faster pit stop points being worth so much, the uh, the Mercedes constructor, despite getting a one two, did not finish that much higher than uh, Mercedes and uh, and McLaren in terms of points. So, I mean, we got saved, right? And and again, Norris owners definitely got saved. I mean, Norris was down to, uh, you know, lower than, than Piastri's points and had a, a, a pretty bad race, was going to finish on 19 points. Fast lap puts him up to 29 and above Charles Leclerc, not that far away from Sainz and realistically not that far away from Russell either. Yes, Hamilton was, was way up the field, right, with, with 46 points. But... I mean, most people had the, the Ferrari assets and uh, Norris did not perform that much worse than them. So putting the two X on him ended up working out. But I feel like with the race that Norris had, just P6 to P6, he he did not really deserve the points, like a 20, 29 pointer. He's lucky that he got the fastest lap, really. So Norris owners are lucky. And if you are one of the people that I recommended go against Norris, right? If you're chasing your mini league rival who had Norris, you should feel pretty hard done by this because you took the brave choice of going without the most popular 2x assets and it it should have paid off it should have been on 19 points and then a random fastest lap gave him 29 points and suddenly everything you did the risk you took didn't pay off or didn't pay off as big right obviously if we went for hamilton or, or russell it still paid off somewhat but uh it's 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 unfortunate for you i will say that but overall the transfers i made made a lot of sense and ended up working out i ended up going for carlos science and upgrade to nico hulkenberg instead of going for leclerc i thought science looked equally good to leclerc and i mean science ended up finishing ahead was that fair there's a lot of ferrari drama right now i think all this massive ferrari drama is quite overblown really it's more a heat of the moment thing from Charles Leclerc and, and the Carlos Sainz sort of driving for himself in a way. So I don't think the drama is as big as people are making it out to be. But uh, Carlos Sainz ended up, ended up finishing with more points than Leclerc and Nick Hulkenberg ended up finishing with more points than Sonoda, even though Sonoda had a great race. Uh, if you're on a similar strategy to me, but you had, instead of Sonoda, you had a Lawson or a Gasly and you upgraded to, to Hulkenberg, then we're talking a, a big amount of points. Alpine sticking it out again after that 2-3 finish in uh, double podium finish in Brazil. And I was talking on the on the deadline stream about Gasly, Sonoda, and Lawson being so close in terms of who is actually the best asset. And then for it to end up being like a pretty big uh difference is, is quite funny. But I mean Nico Hokerberg's 17 points is amazing 10 overtakes in the race. Vegas is just a good track, right? Uh I, I was pretty skeptical of vegas right because when we saw the first look of the of the race it was like yeah it's cool to drive down the strip but you don't really see it that much on the on the shots right uh with all the lights uh, in the way so it's like other oh, they're, they're making they're causing all this traffic in vegas and the locals are angry about it yada 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 but the track's good man what can i say the track's fantastic two years in a row 10 overtakes i mean it really is this the race of c tiers and if if this race like if vegas was held in the first half of the year, I could see going for a full C-tier lineup be really, really good. And I mean, we saw that last year. I think Ocon got like 40 points finishing P4 or something like that. Uh, Colapinto ended up starting somehow. I mean, amazing seeing that crash. I thought he had a concussion. I thought he wouldn't even be able to race. I didn't think Williams would, able to, would be able to put the car together. Starting from pit lane, way better than where he would have started on the grid. Ending up climbing back up to 14th, right? 
so he got six uh six positions in game and, and four overtakes uh lost the position to show at the end uh, which was pretty funny. If you haven't seen shows on board of that overtake and listen to his radio, you definitely should look it up on Twitter. Uh, it's pretty funny. Basically, Colapinto said, I don't know if he said it before this race or earlier that he was like, oh, I don't care if I'm racing Max Verstappen or Shogun Yu, I'm racing everyone. And it was, it's kind of, even though it, it seems, you know, at first glance, it's like, oh, you know, he, wanna race, he, he wants to race everyone. But the distinction is Max Verstappen is the best and Shogun Yu is the worst, right? Uh, because Shogun used me in P20 in every qualifying session for the past like eight races or so. And when Shogun Yu brilliantly drove past Franco Lapinto to finish in P13, and he said, well, he, he basically flipped off Colapinto uh, with his words, and it was really funny. And I think Sho has so many funny onboards, he just never gets any coverage on um, in the actual broadcast, right? So I think you should go and look that up if you haven't. Uh, I was wrong with Bottas. I don't know what happened with Bottas. I didn't I didn't expect much, right? He started P19, only Colapinto in the pit lane behind him. So, you know, I was expecting that and uh, well, there were two DNFs, so he finished in in uh, P18, but really nothing at all. Whereas like Show actually showed some pace. Uh it's only like the second or third time this year that my tip of the week has been uh, wrong from the deadline stream if you don't watch the streams i always do this thing called tip of the week where i uh, write a little ms paint I, I i told everyone to get bolas over show and you know show didn't increase in price again but show did outscore Bottas once more uh the total points for show was only five to be fair but i thought show starting where did he start like p13 or something I did not, yeah, P13 to P13 with five overtakes in there. I did not think, I think, I thought he was going to fall down the pecking order, uh, you know, chalking up the negatives, but he just didn't. So, uh, Bottas turned out to be worse than Show once more, and my decision to sell Show to Bottas when they were similarly priced, like back in, I can't remember, maybe it was Azerbaijan, or maybe it was um, Sandford. I, I don't remember when I sold Bottas to Show or when I sold Show to Bottas. But that decision has been a, a horrid one, right? Because they were the same price. Uh, I think Bottas was slightly cheaper. And I, I did the Bottas move so that I would have some more money in the bank to do a fine, potentially do like a final fix. I think that was my justification for it. And I mean, I thought both of them were bad, right? I was like, oh yeah, Show's worse than qualifying, so maybe he has slightly more upside. But I did not expect this one, right? Where uh, Bottas has not outscored... Uh, Bottas has not outscored show in a single weekend since uh, Monza, right? Six to four, and maybe it was after maybe it was after that that I sold him, and then since then, I mean, show's been really consistent. Seven, six, six, seven, nine, five. He's been a good asset. So, horrid decision for me. If you've had show this entire time, happy days. But I mean, you didn't lose that much on on the show to Bottas transfer, and I hope you gain some money at least to to be able to do some other moves, uh, such as maybe upgrading Alex Albon. Which is the next point of consistent drivers. I tweeted about this earlier. I had to. I haven't seen this horrid run like anywhere. Even someone like a sergeant had not has not been this bad in F1 Fantasy. Minus 16, 11, minus 18, minus 15, minus 16 points. Five DNFs in uh four DNFs in, in five race weekends. And if you've had Albon throughout all of these dnfs please let me know down below i feel so bad for you i sold albon after um uh, after kota so before mexico so i've dodged these three by going to you know i did go to sonoda so i did still hit you know a dnf in in mexico but i i i've definitely avoided some big negatives by selling albon which I'm going to discuss later in my trans, you know, when I actually get into the transfer plans portion of this video. But horrid, horrid run from Albon, and you would imagine that he has potential for points. I mean, look at where Colapinto is, and Albon started this race in like P17 or something like that. I can't exactly remember. You would imagine that he has potential to climb there and actually get some points on the board, but he just, he just keeps getting those DNFs, and if, whether it's him crashing or the car breaking down. He's just so unlucky, and it's not really been his fault either. Yeah, yes, like I mean, the crash in, in in qualifying, sure, in Brazil, but you know, in in the race in Mexico, it wasn't really his fault. It was kind of Yuki Tsunoda and Gasly squeezing him. He didn't really have a place to go, so it's been a combination of just poor luck. And if you've had Albon throughout this, then 
especially like show compared to Albon. If you had asked me who would get at, at, at the Azerbaijan Grand Prix, like, oh, show and Albon are the same price, who are you getting? I would be like, Albon, 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 get Albon. No, they were like, show, are, show is useless. The Sauber's are useless. Get Albon. Williams look really good. And then, like, the total points different, massive. And, and I mean, look at the average score this season for Al all of Albon's DNFs. Minus 1.1 point averaged this season. And I think he's, like, the most owned C-tier asset in the game as well. So, if you've avoided Albon this year, or at least only had him for this, like, middle spell, Congratulations, uh, but yeah, these these Apple DNFs are getting a bit too much. Overall, a decent weekend. I went up 877 places into the top 10k, despite not having any Mercedes assets. Uh, avoiding DNFs definitely helped. Nico Hulkenberg, the GOAT, definitely helped. Carlos Sainz, Lando's, you know, the luck with Lando's fastest lap uh, cannot be uh, overstated. But it's it, that's how F1 Fantasy is sometimes. I'm into the top 10k. Let's hope I stay there for the final two race weekends of the season. Let's talk about what my plans are for Qatar. So this then is my team heading into Qatar, which is another sprint weekend. Do not miss that. The deadline is, of course, after the sprint qualifying as always, which is incredibly broken. And I hope that doesn't stay for next year. But for now, know that everything I say here is null and void come Friday for the sprint qualification. The sprint quality gives us so much information on what assets are the best. Seeing someone start far back, we can go for them as C-tier assets. So I'm not even really going to discuss the C-tiers that much, rather than the fact that I have 1.4 million in the bank. So I have some wiggle, wiggle room here, right? Bottas is likely just stuck at Bottas at 6.6 .6 million for the rest of the year, unless I do some other downgrade on one of my premiums. Maybe Nico Hulkenberg down to someone. Maybe I can squeeze in Shogun Yu over Bottas, but likely... Bottas is just staying, and I'd rather work with one of the better C-tier assets uh, and, and just keep Bottas as this, you know, the driver that I hopefully doesn't DNF, but just going to stay on a, on a, you know, plus five to minus two points over the race weekends. It's really not that big of a deal. But the interesting thing, then, are what strategy we should go for in Qatar. I know a lot of people have chips remaining, and I'll if I have time, I'll, I'll make a separate video about the chips uh, for the end of the season. I don't have any chips, and this is my transfer plans, so I'm going to leave that out of it for now. But I'm going to, you know, I know a lot of people will be using things like the triple DRS this week, which means that I'm not expecting to come out of this week with a blue arrow. I'm expecting to get a red arrow. I just need to minimize it so that I can, in the final race weekend, of the season i can maybe get some points there and stay within the top 10k i'm expecting myself to go down in qatar and i hopefully can then go up again the next for the final race weekend of the season so that i remain within the top 10k top 10k is still the final goal but i'm very aware that since i don't have a chip i'm at a disadvantage this weekend and if you have chips i'm going to talk about that uh, either in my deadline stream Sprint quality watch along stream, all of that good stuff, which is happening this weekend, of course. So sprint quality watch along on Friday, then a deadline stream uh, for the sprint on Saturday afternoon, my time, uh, two hours before the team lock deadline. Do not miss it here on this channel. We'll be doing all the good stuff as usual, the, the tier lists and the team submissions and uh, panicking about what to do with our teams. All of that hap is happening this weekend as always. But for my personal plans, then, uh, there's a lot of things I'm looking at. Uh, one thing that I think is important is that now that the championship is wrapped up, Oscar Piastri kind of becomes an option again. Uh, and what I mean by that is I've kind of written Piastri off as an option. Uh, I know I had him in Brazil because I thought McLaren looked really good in practice. They did look really good in practice in Brazil. They looked pretty dominant. Then the weather changed and they weren't dominant anymore. But I'm kind of I kind of wrote off wrote Piastri off uh, for uh, you know the, the last couple of races just because of the scrapping of the papaya rules right uh, I thought they would hand points to Lando Norris which they did um, and overall Norris has outscored Piastri but like if you look at Piastri's points since like Singapore right he won in 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 Baku of course twenty six thirty twenty six sixteen twenty two compared to Lando Norris. Yes, Lando Norris is outscoring him, but it's not by that much. And it's only in a couple of weekends. So, like, he's, he's slightly above, but not really miles ahead. And Piastri is definitely someone that if he's on it, 
he can definitely go and win. And the, the Papaya Rolls are fully back. They're racing each other now. They want to get the 1-2 finish, of course, so that they stay ahead of Ferrari and win the Constructors. But they're not handing any points to Lando anymore. And I think for that reason, if Piastri is ahead, you know, Lando is not going to get a free pass anymore. And they might even tell Lando to stay behind because, you know, they gave Oscar Piastri's sprint win in Brazil to Lando. So if they're 1-2 in the Qatar, in, in Qatar and, and Lando, even if Lando's pushing, they might tell Lando to, like, hold off slightly, you know. Piastri gave you a win earlier. Play the team game and, and defend for uh, and, and let Piastri win. Now, following dirty air is difficult. So I think if Piastri's ahead, I think he could just stay ahead anyway. But there could be fresher tires and, and things like that going on. So I think Piastri becomes an option again. Uh, he has been consistent, right? He, he's the, the one driver who hasn't DNF'd all year. So that's something to, to add into it. And he could go DNF-less throughout this year. And especially if McLaren look good uh, in, in practice, and we're expecting McLaren to be good in Qatar, he could be a really, really good asset to get in for a triple McLaren uh, build once again. The problem with that, which you I think you can see right here, is that Oscar Piastri is grayed out. Uh, if I remove uh, Nico Hulkenberg there, you can see that he is at 25.6 million. And right now, with Nico Hulkenberg in there, I have 25.5 million. So I can't. Uh, I can't get Piastri in without making another transfer. Now, is that the end of the world? Not really. Uh, this is if I want to keep Lando Norris, of course. But I would have to sell Nico Hulkenberg, which is unfortunate considering how much I like Nico Hulkenberg as an option. And especially unfortunate since, like, there's a big upside for C tier as specifically in sprint weekends. So say we get to the sprint qualifying and Hulkenberg has a, a bad sprint qualifying for some reason. And I look at him and see like, oh, Hulkenberg looks like a fantastic option for this week in Qatar. That sort of scraps Piastri as an option, especially alongside Lando Norris for the, the, the triple up, right? So really then it's, we're going down to Yuki Tsunoda, Lawson and, and Gasly again. Right. But... I do want to mention some, uh, like, uh, you know, the obvious move here looks to be these three, right? I do want to mention Alex Albon briefly. Alex Albon is now down to 8.7 million this year. He seems like a bargain, right? DNFs have not really been his fault. You know, he's been incredibly unlucky. Is it his time to get points? Surely he cannot DNF again. Am I so crazy that I'm going for Alex Album? It's not someone I'm aiming towards. But I do think I would go for Alex Album over Shogun Yu. Surely it has to turn around. The car has been decent at the, these last couple of races. I mean, we'll see what Frank Colapinto has been able to do. I think if if I'm if I end up upgrading Valtteri Bottas, say I, I stick with signs here. And uh, I, I, you know, say that Pierre Gasly looks like a really good option uh, for, you know, he's starting P20 in the qualification after something happened. Or, uh, say, just say that Pierre Gasly looks really, really good after a, a mistake in the sprint of qualification. And then I'm expecting him to be right up there being like P7 in the main qualification for the main race, right? So I'm expecting Gasly to be good this weekend in Qatar. I can upgrade Bottas to Alex Albon, right? Again, I don't want to talk too much about the C tiers, but I don't think Albon is that bad of an option. You can't look at past points and expect that to continue, really. You have to look at the future and see whether he's a good option going forward. And the Williams has abilities to overtake. And surely his luck has to end, uh, his bad luck has to end at some point. So, uh, I don't think, just because of all of the NFs on Albon, I don't think it's that bad, right? I said Williams were bad this weekend because of their lack of parts, but surely now they fixed Colapinto's car. If if they can stay out of the wall or, you know, not TNF in, in Qatar in, in the practice and the sprint qualifying, they're just going to race the entire weekend in Qatar, theoretically. So, uh... I, I would hope that uh, his luck turns. That is, is it, again, it's not like I'm gunning towards Alex Albon, but I, I would pick him over Shogun Yu because they're at the same price point. I mean, Shogun Yu right now is 8.6 million and Alex Albon is 8.7. And I think Alex Albon is a better option than Shogun Yu for this weekend. 
Uh, despite shows shows good showing in recent times, I, I, I you have to look ahead. You can't look back. The past points are not happening again. There could be a trend there. But again, I do think this trend of his DNFs has to end at some point. Again, I, I know he's just as likely to, to DNF this race as he was pre the previous races but uh i i would i would hope that it, 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 it he sees an upturning form for his sake as well but I, i'm not expecting him to continue this run so alex albon is an option again not one i'm gunning for the main thing for me seeing as i don't have a chip is that i need to get the premiums correctly right uh I'm expecting McLaren and Ferrari to be the best, constructor-wise. I don't think Mercedes are going to be up there. I still don't trust Red Bull because, you know, Max does wonders in that car. Yes, but Checo's still completely useless. You know, granted, they got they got some points here, but they still were the fourth highest scorer uh, in in um, in Vegas. So, I'm, I'm not looking at Red Bull at all. I'm probably not getting Mercedes in. The reason I didn't go for Mercedes was that I could have McLaren and Ferrari in Qatar. I do have three free transfers, so I, I could rearrange quite a lot if I wanted to. But I'm expecting Mercedes to be bad again. Maybe they're good. We'll see. But, this is the, you know, even the drivers, like even Russell and Hamilton said, said as much, like, we don't know why the car was good today. And that's kind of embarrassing for them after finishing one too, you know. Uh, so I, I'm not looking at Mercedes yet. McLaren and Ferrari are likely staying. And in that case, I mean, I could do, again, I can't do whatever I want without da downgrading something. And again, there's no one to downgrade Colapinto or Bottas to. So if I want to get someone other than Sainz alongside Landon Norris, it is Hulk that has to go down to one of those three boys at that 10 million price, uh, 10 million price points. Uh, or 11 million, rather. Um, Pierre Gasly, Lawson, Sonoda, or go down all the way to an Alex Albon, right? These four, Yuki is at 11.4, Albon at 8.7, uh, Liam is at 11 million, and, and Gasly is at 10.8. These four are my options to downgrade Hulk to if I want to upgrade and keep Norris. Now, that's not a guarantee that I keep Norris, but, you know, that is how I would get uh, a Leclerc in there or a uh, piastri in there if i go without norris things get a bit more interesting right say ferrari looks really good suddenly i have 2.9 million i could just straight up upgrade this to alex album right say uh, i want to go for another common pick which we saw earlier in the season with charlotte claire and oscar piastri and and not go f basically bet against norris in this case again i have eight million here i cannot afford uh to upgrade alex albon at this point or bought us to album uh or, or show here but i can just keep hulkenberg right uh i i, I stay with 1.4 million in the bank like look if i upgrade this 1.4 1.4. So land on signs are basically equal to Leclerc and Piastri. So in that case, I could keep Hulkenberg. Or even, uh, I'm pretty sure I can still upgrade to K-Mag, right? So staying land on Norris signs or switching to Piastri plus uh, Leclerc gives me the option to go for Kevin Magnussen. If Kevin Magnussen looks like the best option in... Um, uh, after the the uh, sprint qualifying. So, K-Mag, definitely on my cards. I know he did not have the greatest race here. Nico Hulkenberg outscored him quite heftily in, in fantasy. But that doesn't mean that, you know, K-Mag's not an option. Uh, he was just fortunate enough to qualify in a quite unfortunate position in, in P12 and not like a, you know, P18, right? Um stayed p12 so he didn't have that bad of a race it's just that you know five overtakes five points not enough for for an increase whereas uh hulkenberg had that massive 10 overtakes um and and finished you know one point one position higher and got actual points in the race and in the qualifying you know 17 points is, is incredible for a ctrs so overall i really like where my team's set up i'm totally fine keeping franco and bottas and having that flexible pick of being able to go up to a k mag with a uh, McLaren Ferrari mixed team or a full Ferrari team seems really really powerful and I really really like that the the one thing I can't go for right is the Lando plus Leclerc or Lando plus uh, Piastri option then I have to downgrade but like that seems fine if McLaren looks really strong I'm, I'm okay to downgrade to you know Yuki Tsunoda 
uh, or or Pierre Gasly, right? Or again, Alex Albon. I don't mind that at all. So I feel like the budget that I have my team at is really, really well set up, set up for this weekend. I had a, I have a lot of options to go for, and feeling like being this flexible with the three transfers heading into a sprint qualifying session where I can look and assess things and then pick the best C tiers that I want, the best um, premiums that I want, regardless of what happens. I feel like that is incredibly, incredibly powerful. And then once we get, again, if it looks like McLaren, McLaren are the strongest, right? I want to go for the triple McLaren lineup. And then it looks like Kevin Magnussen is the best C tier. Then I have to evaluate and do some, you know, uh, MS Paint calculations on, on, on stream and figure out which uh, combination gives me the most points and which combination has the highest upside. Uh, but really, it's mostly about avoiding, avoiding DNFs in a weekend where a lot of people will be playing their 3x. I don't think I'm going to go that differential to 3x users. I think I'm just going to try and, and get their points and, uh, you know, they're getting the 3x points for whoever they put the 3x on. But... Uh, I will I would at least not fall that far behind them. I'm hoping I can stay within the 10 top 10k for Qatar um, But roughly that's my idea for this weekend uh, If you agree with me or if you have an additional point, please leave it in the comments down below I would love to hear it. Don't miss the sprint qualifying watch along and discussion uh, We'll start about you know uh, 15 minutes before sprint qualifying starts on Friday, so join me here, watch the mayhem, and then after the sprint qualifying, I'll discuss the results of that sprint qualifying and how that affects my decision. Then we're doing a deadline stream uh, two hours before the deadline lock on Saturday. Uh, look forward to another video, maybe on Thursday or Friday, discussing more things that have, have uh, progressed and happened throughout the week. Uh, if you haven't already, fill out the survey link in the description below to properly leave your thoughts uh, on the F1 Fantasy game for next year. I'm super excited for the survey, the results of that. I will be talking about that more in the off-season, the results of that. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's about it for this video. Uh, if you haven't already, please subscribe, please like the video. Thank you so much for watching. I appreciate you a ton. I will see you later on this week. Goodbye.